Welcome to our second session on um, for the Do You Speak Tech Pandemic Edition presented by the Second Language Intercultural Council and the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium. Um, so our session today, we're going to be focusing on apps, extensions, and add-ons. And so uh, don't worry, we'll talk about the difference between them. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, super important that you, you know, be able to, to be tested on what the difference between those are. So if you're just joining us for the first time tonight, we do have a session with six different sessions. So you can click on the, the link there um, on the image in the presentation to go right to the ERLC to, to register for the Do You Speak Tech for any of the sessions. And again, the, the bit.ly at the top there is, is a short link for you to be able to get to our session presentation with the notes and everything else. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and I'll uh, try to get to them as soon as I can and just, you know, whenever they come up. So today we're going to reflect on and actually explore some strategies as well for increasing teacher efficacy and student engagement in the language classroom through the implementation of technologies. So we've got just a few uh, it, a very short introduction before we look at, again, if you is this is the first time you're joining us, we're going to take a quick look at the two publications of research that will kind of frame some of what we're talking about tonight. Our biggest section is going to be this third one here on apps. So we're going to look at some different apps and websites and uh, try a few of them out as well. Then we will look at Chrome extensions and add-ons. If we run out of time, these are the two sections that we can fly through because it's uh, more of a, this extension or this add-on does this, try it or, and so you'll have the presentation with all of the links and the explanations and the speaker notes so that you can explore those when, when you've got some time. And then we'll have some time for questions once the, the session is, is finished here. So introductions. My name is Stephanie. I work at Edmonton Public Schools at ISLI, the Institute for Innovation in, in Second Language Education, where I coordinate the French programs there. I volunteer for SLIC, the Second Language Intercultural Council with the Alberta Teachers Association. And one of the, the things that I do, part of my role is, is doing the the Do You Speak Tech series. I do love educational technology. I found uh, not only was it more engaging, but uh, would really save me some time when I was teaching three, uh, three different grades of French second language at the junior high level. I often had nine classes, so about 300, 350 students, and the technology was really uh, making that a lot more possible for me. My email address is there at the at the end, so please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. It's just stephanie.jackson at epsb.ca. So a very quick entry, you know, intro activity. Just tell me how you're feeling tonight. Uh, you can use any emoji that you like, or you can also use uh, your own uh, emoji from um, from your phone or from your computer. We're just typing the number. And this is a quick little activity that you can do with your with your students. If you four, yay, I've got some happy peeps with me today and fives, I'm glad. And if you're not happy, that's okay if you're a little bit apprehensive. If you uh, would like to do this activity with your students, with your meeting online with them, please don't hesitate to copy the emojis right from my slideshow if it saves you some time. We'll also be talking about uh, an extension, yes, an extension later that will um, that will help you insert emojis into your emails and texts and slideshows and things like that. Yeah, but three a little bit apprehensive. That's okay. I hope that we can hope that we can help you with some of these technologies today and show you that it's not so scary. My first tip before we get delve into things is uh, Google Chrome. So I know that there's quite the debate between internet browsers and what you should be using. I am going to say Google Chrome 
Peer Gear Browser this, this time because in the world of educational technology, we often are using apps that are connected with Google. So YouTube, Google Drive, Google Slides, and a lot of those apps that we're going to be talking about tonight just function a lot better in Google Chrome. So if you're ever in a Google Doc and you are working on it and you notice that it's very glitchy, it may be because you're not using Google Chrome. And uh, please don't use Internet Explorer. It's not, it's super slow. And there's a lot of websites that uh, don't have full functionality with Internet Explorer anymore. So an app and an extension and an add-on. I wanted uh, to explain the difference here quickly, just so that you can um, get a bit of an overview of what you know, the different functionalities are, but it's not super important that you be able to distinguish. There's also sometimes uh, hybrids. So we'll talk about those and I have some examples for you later on. So apps are like a computer program, but they're housed within the internet. So you need to go to a website in order to use them. Or, you know, on your mobile device, you would have the app um, that you would open. And it's basically like opening a, a website on your phone. Um, sometimes you can go to a website to use these. So if you're uh, Kahoot or YouTube, those are also websites um, as well as apps. And sometimes uh, apps, like there's certain mo mobile apps that are only available on Android or only available in iOS or whatever it might be. A Chrome extension is a little mini program that attaches to like your Chrome browser, your internet browser, and just gives it a little more functionality. And then your add-ons are going to extend the capabilities of some of your Google apps. So for example, Google Docs, Google Slides, um, Google Spreadsheets and Forms, an add-on is gonna you know, kind of trick it out and give it a little trick that it can do on top of the, of the normal things. And then the hybrids. So for example, uh, Pear Deck. Pear Deck is an app and it's also a website, but it also has an add-on for Google Slides. And we're actually going to look at, at Pear Deck later on tonight. So I won't, I won't spend too much time on that. So just very quickly, the, the two Canadian publications that uh, we're going to be taking some research quotes from tonight to you know, make sure that what we're talking about is, is data driven and, and research driven. The first one is from the CASALT, so the Canadian Association for Second Language Teachers. And you can go to their website to, to download or to, to purchase a print version of their um, very recent literature review on facilitating language learning through technology and uh, a great, great resource. Uh, I know that research can sometimes be very dry, but this is uh, super easy to read. I find it extremely digestible and you'll actually find some um, examples in there that you can take and, and implement in your classroom. And then the second publication is from uh, ISLI, so from where I work at Edmonton Public Schools, on the characteristics of successful language programs, so a literature, literature review on the research around uh, the characteristics of, of language programming and, and what makes that successful. An amazing resource if you're working with teachers and trying to really, you know, implement more quality and really you know, move forward your language programs in, in your institutions. And you can click there. It's free on the Edmonton Public Schools Resource Hub. And you um, might even find some other resources that are there. Everything uh, during the pandemic, we're offering our teacher created or teacher and student resources for, for free. And so you can go check that out. And then there's also uh, all of our French resources will be free because uh, we complete those using some, some funding that comes from, from federal grants. And so check it out. Now let's get right into the into the big the big uh, section tonight is going to be our apps bucket list. Now, first, before we even talk about uh, specific apps, I want to make sure that uh, you're not thinking that within the next week you're going to be trying all of these. Uh, take one one that kind of piques your interest uh, that you haven't used before, or maybe an app or a website that you've used a little bit, but maybe we'll. Uh, give you some ideas for some, you know, more functionality or some expanded options for that website. And just take one and sit with that for like 
a month even. It might take you a month or two months to be able to get to the point where you're ready to kind of take on another app. So then you're going to go back to the presentation and kind of go through and, and get some inspiration and find another idea that you're going to try. But please, for your own sanity, do not try and implement everything at once. So we're looking at the, the research around implementing technology or computer assisted language learning, bringing technology into our classroom can really benefit our students by providing that authentic input. And that idea of giving individualized instruction where students can, can work more on their own at their own pace. But the flip side of that coin is also having more, more collaboration, right? Which is great. Tonight, we're gonna be highlighting some technologies that will really help with those those two sides of that coin. So um, while the individualized instruction, a little bit of, of more autonomous working, but also especially collaboration. And when you're looking at more specifically mobile devices being implemented in the classroom, the research is finding that that really um, helps with contributing to greater learner autonomy and encourages collaboration as well. And so when you're focusing on, on mobile devices and a lot of the apps and um, websites and activities that we're talking about tonight can be completed on a mobile device. I think maybe five, six years ago, a little bit before that, if you had asked me, I would not have ever imagined students using a phone to write an essay. But who's to say that it's more comfortable to be hunched over your computer on a keyboard writing an essay than lounge back in a chair with your phone in hand and maybe even using some text to speech to help you help you do that writing. And so I think that it's really, you know, mobile devices have changed learning and, and how we learn. And it's maybe time to embrace that because our students definitely have. Now here's our, our kind of Google app starter pack. So some of the ones that I've pulled out, definitely not everything. Google has got a lot of apps out there. And the ones with the stars are the ones that we're gonna be talking about more tonight. Uh, Google Classroom is a huge, amazing, amazing resource, but we have a session on specifically Google Classroom later on. And we also have uh, our last session, the new normal. We'll be talking a little bit more about Google Meet. And then uh, we also have a session in this series about YouTube. So I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about those ones tonight. Um, with Cardboard and VR, actually, I'm not going to talk about that uh, tonight. We're going to focus more on Drive and Keep. Um, and the Google Cardboard and VR was more of a, uh, uh, if we have time, then we'll, I've got a couple slides on why you might want to use virtual reality of a classroom, but we'll take a look at that, you know, later if we have time. So our first app and tip is a super simple one and one that I uh, found from a blog online that's uh, a teacher that I follow on, on Twitter. And, but it can have some big impact because it deals with providing in engaging feedback on student work, which increases motivation and that, you know, in turn is going to lead to more learning. So this is our old school meets new school. What you're gonna need with this is some student work. So either a Google doc or a Google slideshow. And then you're gonna to wanna to use the app for Google Keep. You'll see from this little image here, base, if you click on this image, it will actually take you to a, an, uh, the blog post where I got this idea from. And uh, the teacher there gives a really great and super short tutorial on how to create and use these stickers. And it's basically a way of putting little old school, old school stickers um, that you've created in Google Drawings by using Google Keep. And when you're reading student work in a Google Doc or a Google Slide, you can kind of just slap the sticker on there. Um, this little plastic image there, if you click on there, I have a Google folder of, I made some stickers in French. So if you teach French as a second language, you can take those. And if not, the teacher uh, on this blog actually put her folder of the Google Drive stickers as well. And so you can go in and use her same make copies and, you know, uh, change them however you, however you think. And so just sort of a, a little short engaging little tip. If you're looking for something that's neat, try out Google Keep. Google Keep is also an extension. So you can, for example, if you're on a website and you want to 
you know, keep a part of that website or write a note about it, then you can use Google Keep to do that. And so it's a, a neat little, you know, functionality with that. So next, so the research shows us, you know, some of the types of activities that will help with building vocabulary um, and, and grammar. So using things that have that sort of visual word association, um, like flashcards, right? Uh, little short yet authentic text, like an SMS or text message, subtitling. So, you know, subtitling an image or something like that. And those kind of gaming and virtual, virtual environments. And also tests that encourage collaboration and learning grammar in context are going to be a lot more effective at teaching our students um, about how to use the language than working on grammar and vocabulary in isolation. And so also bringing in this range of multimedia is not only going to interest our students more, but the research is showing that that's going to lead to better learning outcomes for our students. So with that in mind, we always want to keep our eye on the end goal, which is what students can do with the language. I don't think any of us, none of our goals, none of us as, as language teachers, our goal isn't that the students be able to list a thousand animals and conjugate a bunch of verbs in isolation. We want them to be able to go out into the world outside the confines of our classroom and be able to do something with the language. And so when we keep that in mind, when we're bringing technology into the classroom, um, we want to keep in mind that we're bringing a technology that has students using the language for a purpose and something that's authentic, that exists in real life. So for example, writing a text message or a direct message, that's something that kids do hundreds of times a day. And so when you're bringing that in as, as a source of writing, then it's authentic. It's not only more engaging for them and more motivating, but it's also leading to better learning outcomes with regards to grammar and vocabulary. Commenting on a social media post, an infographic, that's a, also an amazing way to bring in some very authentic reading into your classroom. For example, I work with a teacher who found this cute infographic about um, common uh, Valentine's Day uh, traditions in France. And so she brought that into class because it was very different from, from here in Canada. And so some in authentic and interesting reading that, you know, is about real life people somewhere. And then when we're talking about this last uh, captioning, a GIF, a meme or an infographic, um, we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper tonight. So you might, I'm sure you've all seen memes and, and GIFs and things like that around on your, your social media or running around the internet and, and your tech streams and things like that. And you may nev not have thought about bringing these into your classroom, but there's a lot of different ways that you can use GIFs and memes um, in your class. So one way is get your point across with humor. So for example, this is a GIF slash meme that I used uh, in the beginning, you know, first days of school, you could use this for, so my face when students use Google Translate, and it's just sort of a, you know, a little reminder to them that, you know, we're not using Google Translate to create the language in this classroom, and we can talk about it. Um, I actually, if you click on that image, it will take you to a little playlist I have of some of those, those Google Translate songs. That's a little kind of side tip for you if you're ever dealing with, you know, that, trying to make sure that kids aren't handing in work that's been translated online. Uh, you know, every once in a while, taking a few minutes to watch one of those Google Translate songs can really hit home that, you know, it's not the best way to, to go about it. You could give the class a topic. So besides that's more teachers created memes when we're talking about getting your point across with humor, maybe your class rules, things like that. Uh, give the class a topic and create a slideshow of GIFs and memes. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. I've got a resource for you for, for doing that in your class. You could uh, give either give the students a topic. You could give them something to uh, a writing prompt and have them discuss that and then take it further by having them read everyone else's sort of contributions and so then you're extending that from not just a writing activity right um and then bringing in authentic reading and cultural content through infographics which we, we talked about a little bit earlier 
So by integrating these types of texts that students interact with regularly, we can really increase their engagement because we're bringing that learning from outside the classroom in and then we're bringing what we're learning inside the classroom out into the real world for them. So it's really going to motivate them a lot more. So we're going to take a few seconds, a few minutes to actually practice this. So we've got about four or five minutes. I'd like you to uh, go to the link in the presentation and I will actually put it in the chat as well here. Just give me a second. And I'm going to share that screen so that we can see this here. Now, this is an idea that I got from a teacher and sort of ran with it. So you'll see here, the first slide is uh, instructions in English. The second slide is an example. Um, the third slide, I have instructions in French because here in Canada, often we have, uh, I'm working with French teachers. And so I put the instructions in French there and then sort of an example, which is writing in French, speaking in French for pronunciation. Um, so what's really neat with Google Slides is if you go into View Master, you can actually change the backgrounds of the slides. So I love the idea of getting students to caption memes in the class. What I don't love is them going to a meme generator online and having the whole world of super inappropriate memes open to them. And not only is that just not what I would like in my classroom, plus, I'm, we're going to a meme generator. Oftentimes, those all of the memes are in English, and if I'm teaching a different language, I would like them to be, you know, as much as possible in the target language. And so, bringing them into this slideshow, you can go into the master and you just add slides, and you're basically like creating a slide like you normally would. Except when you're done and you click to close this, um, it makes those slides that you've created part of so we click on the little arrow down here part of the background and so you can click where the text boxes are and things like that so i just chose some you know more appropriate memes here and so you can add whichever image you'd like um, our our topic is going to be teacher pd or language learning so if you want to go ahead and create your meme this is just for us to use and give it a try and see how that goes. If you're using this in class, um, I would get students to put their name in the in the speaker notes. If you want to know, oh, I think I just need to uh, fix my sharing settings. I saw an email come in. Uh, I can view. Thank you very much. I'm changing that right now to editor. And so if you refresh your page right now, you should be able to. There you go. I see. Can, I can see you refreshing. You should be able to edit there. Sorry about that. I thought I had fixed all the share settings on everything, but. So yes, if you are looking at doing some formative assessment with this, you may want students to put their names in the speaker notes so that you know who did what. Another way that you can use the, the speaker notes section is after students have been given some time to create some memes, you can kind of use that as like a comment stream. So they go and read other students' memes and they go into the notes section and they type their name like Stephanie and like, oh, this is really funny or things like that. And so, of course, you would you know, have to talk about respectful commenting and things like that. And the beauty with Google Docs is that no one's going to get away with anything inappropriate or bullying without you knowing who did what. And so me after learning about all the technology I could use in class but haven't tried yet. Yes. Yeah. So you can see there's some kind of fun different memes and then there's also a blank slide there that you can use. So if you have had your own image or you can go, you know, insert image and if you had a different idea and uh, you know just add some of those in. But yeah, so the view master is kind of a neat way to to customize the backgrounds and slides. And a way that you can 
get some writing done in class, maybe some extend that to some reading. I also like the idea or, or the fact that when they're doing this writing, it's uh, super short and, you know, not, uh, you know, you have to really condense your idea into something that's not too, too long. And yeah, engaging for the kids because it's sort of what they're doing on their own time anyways, looking at these kinds of things. And, and yeah, okay, go back to sharing the presentation. And oh, also in you'll see in the um, instructions slides on there. If you go into the notes section, there is a link. Get your own copy of this template. So if you click on that link and open it, it will make a copy of the blank template for you, and you can take that and use it in your class or whatever you want. And let's move on. So another reason for promoting collaboration and this authentic interaction amongst your language learnings in your classroom is because it motivates them and reduces anxiety. And that reducing anxiety, I think, especially in a second language classroom, we deal with a lot of students who have anxiety around making mistakes in the second language or they're scared of their accent or, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of our students just you know, have a lot of anxiety around producing the language, especially in front of peers. And so promoting collaboration and these authentic interactions is really gonna help them reduce that anxiety. So that's gonna lead to, to better learning outcomes, right? The benefits with that in mind, the benefits of collaboration, as well as the fact that the very nature of writing has changed because of technology. These collaborative writing platforms like blogs and Google Docs and social networking, that's just become very normal. And that's what writing and literature and communication is right now, right? And so being able to have our students take advantage of how or being able to take advantage of how writing has changed and these new technologies in our classroom is really going to set our students up for success um, to be able to produce the second language outside of our classroom. So another collaborative task that you can do with, with Google Slides is I know uh, and as, when I started teaching, I definitely spent a lot of time looking for a bunch of animal and food images, and I would give those to students, and we would, you know, I would go through the slideshow of giving them the vocabulary, and they would write them all down, and, you know, it would take forever, and I'm always wondering how many of those hundred food items did those students actually retain, and so a little bit of a kind of a switch in mindset is to maybe have the students collaborate together on a Google slideshow to, uh, to source the words for you. So each student gets a slide and each slide is one word. Um, again, if you wanna see, or you know, for some formative assessment or see who's doing what thing, you can have them put that into the notes section. Uh, if you're doing adverbs or adjectives, I suggest doing like that game four pick one word so you actually have four pictures um and so for example if you're looking at i'm just gonna show these two examples here so you can see these animal so it's sort of two different um ways that um we've done this so for example, with les animaux, so these are, you know, simple vocab words, and I changed these instructions into English so that when we do sessions, you can see. So they're going to choose an animal and they claim it by typing it in French onto the, onto the, the slide here. So I just had a blank columns with with bullets and uh, basically they go in and they find the, the animal that they wanted to add and they're going to write it here. So once it's claimed, they insert a blank slide and they type their name in the notes section. In the title, they're gonna put the name of the animal with the correct name, like the article like our un or a or the or whatever language you're teaching. And then they put in an animal on there. And so, no, they're not writing down 20 animal names, but I can guarantee you that this child remembers this animal even today. 
because it was something that was important enough for him to go look up the word. And also there's a bit of a process to that, right? Going to look up the word and then going to find an image. Uh, one, two, three, four. He looked it up, you know, six times. And so that's really going to create, uh, you know, deeper, deeper learning in the student's mind. The iOS and Android image play to make your own gifts and insert them into Google Slides. Oh, thank you, Joe, for that tip. I'm going to... I'm going to check that out. Um, and then also, I mean, this student, Lavash, I mean, they just, they really had super fun with it for one. And then, no, I'm pretty sure that they did not remember the 200 animals list that I had given them, right? And then they also came up with some animals that I never would have thought about. Like, I wouldn't have told them a swan, but this child like really wanted to know what a swan it was in French. So go for it, right? And so something a little bit different. And then with, uh, so this is like, this one was a little bit different because I actually had some words that I wanted them to uh, use. And then they also added some as well. So for this one, if you have the list of words for them, uh, they would claim it by highlighting the word. And then same thing, they go through and, and do their, their image. And so this one was sal or dirty. And so you can see if you just had the one image, like, does it mean dirty or does it mean dishes? And so if you have an adverb or an adjective or something, it's a lot better to have this sort of four images and really helps you understand a lot better what the, what the word means. Another idea, you can animate these titles um, so that when you play the slideshow for the class, they just see the images and, you know, play a game on who can guess, who can guess it first, right? So there's some examples for you. And we'll just go back to... So a similar uh, collaboration activity that you can do, and uh, this one uh, was an example actually from an elementary uh, teacher. And so trying to implement more technology in her grade two classroom. And so an activity for students to collaborate online. So instead of having students work together in their little group. So this was pre-COVID, but uh, actually an activity that transfers very nicely to online learning, because the whole goal was that students would work with students who were on different sides of the classroom. So they did all their collaboration online. And what they were doing was, I'll show you an example here. So first they would get a blank Google drawing, where you could also do a Jamboard and a topic, so sports, and they're going to, in their groups, through the chat feature in the Google Docs, decide back and forth, you know, and who's going to take which of the boxes to fill in, uh, and they're going to come up with some categories, and then they're going to brainstorm some words, and, you know, work on this collaboratively together to come up with as much you know, vocabulary and things around the topic that we're that we're going to be introducing. So we're going to be learning about sports soon. Um, and so here can we, you know, get them to elicit some some vocabulary. And then the next step is for them to in their groups then take that and create a little poem. Um, so they did a little acrostic poem. And so you know sports S P O R T S. And uh, they've got their little list of what they need to have in there. And so just a little sort of simple one class, you know, activity, formative assessment, writing activity that they can do uh, that's really working those collaboration and collaboration online, especially skills. So uh, that idea that when you're working on this, uh, we need to decide who's working in each box. Otherwise, we're all going to be typing on top of each other. And uh, when do we... Uh, say, okay, I'm done with my box. Can I add to another one or, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's kind of getting this, this brainstorming and mind map done. And, and yeah, I'm just going to close these extra things here. Excellent. So moving on. Another collaborative Google app that you can use is Jamboard. So this is also within Google Drive, a pretty neat activity. Um, you can brainstorm vocabulary and phrases related to a topic. You can have writing prompts, that kinds of ideas. And I've got a link here for a Jamboard that I made that um, 
if you're looking for, and it's actually a forced copy link, so it'll make a copy of this for you if you'd like to, to use that in your own classrooms. And it's just opening up here. And so sometimes, you know, as a grown woman, I don't know what a grade seven kid would find authentic for writing or reading. Like, what does a grade seven kid read nowadays? What do they write? What are they talking about with their friends? Um, what are they listening to? Uh, what kind of music is in nowadays? And so often starting the year, it's a, you know, kind of a neat idea to actually get that from the students. So the first one is just a placemat. So you can give them one kind of jam board per, per student to put in their own ideas. What do you listen to? What do you read? What do you write? What do you talk about? And then uh, there's some other slides here that just sort of talk about that more specifically. So what do you like to read, et cetera. So the first slide is uh, the one with the placemat is a little bit more if you were giving um, like one Jamboard to each student. So each student would put in more than one idea into, into each of those boxes. And then if you wanted to collect the ideas of, of kind of all the students together onto one Jamboard, then you can, Kind of put the question so again i used to mean to kind of put this boring question what do you like to read blah, blah. so i put a you know spongebob there and it's a little more you know a little more happy i guess and uh this is sort of more the format that you would use for the whole class so each kid could put one idea per sticky note and then a few just sort of tips when you're doing jam boards with a large group. So if you're doing that, you know, you've got a class of 30 or 40 kids and you've got them all on one Jamboard, an idea is to have multiple slides. So uh, put, you know, break uh, your questions onto one question per slide. And then you're going to uh, put students in groups. So you're going to break, you know, if you have 30 students and five slides, you're going to put six kids on each slide or, you know, and then have them, you know, work through at their own pace. And so you're going to get a lot less congestion on that on each of the slides and it's not as, as crazy. Also, uh, tell the students not to repeat each other. So when you go to the Jamboard, if your idea is um, like, I really like rock music. Um, if you want to upvote that, so you want to say, yeah, I, I like rock music too, you click on that sticky note and you add a star, um, but you're not going to make another sticky note that says, I also like rock music, right? And then uh, placing like items together. So for example, um, you know, what do we like to talk about or something like that? If you've got an idea that's different, but sort of similar to someone else's, just kind of drag your sticky note in that similar kind of area. And that, you know, kind of helps for afterwards when you, um, if you're looking at them by yourself, it kind of helps categorize things a little bit. It's also great for the students to do that. And um, it, if you're gonna kind of have a class discussion later, if you have those like items together, it really helps with that flow of discussion. And so getting the students to do that um, is, is a good idea. So students break up big groups onto multiple slides so that they're kind of all going, you know, you don't have 30 kids on one slide. Uh, don't repeat each other and upvote with the star. And then, uh, yeah, just sort of check that out, Jamboard. And we are going to check it out. So I'm gonna take the link here and post it into the chat. Now, this is actually a Jamboard that was started on our first session. So if you want, you can just take a look at it. And if you have a new idea, then please go ahead. Now, because uh, on the first session we were introducing Jamboard, I have a, and this is an idea for the first, I would say maybe the first three times that you use it with a group, is to have a sort of blank garbage slide at the beginning. And so it's a test this out. So try things. And um, I find if you don't do that, then your slides kind of get messed up really quick because the kids um, and, and people just aren't really sure because you're clicking around and stuff. And so you might accidentally delete something and not know to go control Z to undo it um, or to hit the little back arrow to undo it. Um, so yeah, the first time you're using it with a group, just kind of have this garbage slide. And so people can uh, go in here and um, I could say, uh, yes, I want to upvote this. This was a, this was a, yeah, it is really lots of fun with the kids. So that's an idea that I want to upvote. 
And then if you go through here, it was just a, a sort of outsourcing, crowdsourcing some ideas for reading, writing, speaking, and listening in the language classroom using technology. And so these are ideas from all the participants from the first session. So if you have one that you would like to, to add that hasn't been, been mentioned yet, then please do that. This one, I'm just gonna move the papers. Something was for reading and writing. Yeah. See, we have one already that we can add today. We can say, make a meme for writing. Right, you can change colors and add sticky notes and things like that. So it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat little collaborative tool for Okay, let's go back to our slideshow. I'm starting to get the hang of the sharing different screens. <laughs> okay, moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about assessment and feedback when it comes to computer assisted language learning and how Technology can really make that feedback super easy and even automated, which is amazing. We're talking about, you know, Google Forms and Kahoots or Socratives, you know, and how the kids can get automatic marking and also even automated feedback, which is great. And just keeping in mind that when you're using digital assessments that you're uh, making sure that the, the test and what you or you know, that the assessment is aligning with your learning outcome, right? We talked about some student response systems last time, and so I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail about what each one is today because we talked about that last time. So you can go to the ERLC's YouTube channel and check that out or just check out the speaker notes in the bottom here of the of this slideshow and you'll see about uh, about some of the, the student you know response systems and their differences. We're going to talk about Pair Deck a little bit later on, I'll introduce it, but we're actually going to try Socrative right now. So this is one that um, I really like personally, just because it has more than the multiple choice and true false. So you're going to go to b.socrative.com slash student, you can click on the link right here. I'll also copy it into the chat if you just want to click instead of typing it out. And the room is slick, S-L-I-C. And I'm going to go back to sharing my whole screen so that you can see. So Socrative is really a neat uh, student response system. As you can see, I can already see in the top here how many students I have. And so I can see as you're joining them. Uh, I did put show names. So it's going to ask you what your name is when you come in and show responses and then show results. When I launch the quiz, I can choose whether or not to make it self paced so you can like go back and forwards and kind of, you know, do questions and navigate however you want. Or I can make it so that, you know, I push out a question. And when everybody answers, I push out the next one, you know, so it, you know, is really responsive that way. Completely free as well for educators, which is awesome. And then what's kind of cool is when I go here to the um, go here, like click on a specific question, I can actually see the different answers. So that's kind of cool. And I can just go forward here and I can show the results. I can see, you know, via percentage as well. And it tells me one out of eight has answered. And so I can, it you know, doesn't show the results until you click, which is really neat. You can, as you see, I've added some GIFs and memes and here's some images, there's some memes for, you know, yeah, you can add images and that as part of the, you can also, um, of course, choose if it's A, B, C, or D that's correct, but then you can also give some feedback. So I'm, I'm going to wait because I don't want to kick you all out of the room to go and show you. Actually, I might be able to. Yeah, you can still go. So for example, with this one. 
So this is me, you know, uh, actually doing the quiz. I can share it. So if I give this number to you, for example, you can take that number if you'd like, it's not a problem. Uh, it'll give you a copy of this quiz. So you can share quizzes back and forth, which is really neat. Um, now, if I go on edit here, I can actually give an explanation. So I can, you know, once they've typed in an answer or something, then I can say, um, you know, thank you very much for your response, or I can give them some kind of feedback. I can actually add an answer, so a correct answer, and I can add more than one. So if I'm doing, you know, some vocab or grammar work with students, um, I can put in, uh, you know, that it's looking for those short answers. And then, of course, on a multiple choice, I can choose uh, one or two or multiple answers um, as being correct. So then the student would be told uh, whether or not they got that correct. And I can choose when I'm launching the quiz, whether or not they get the feedback right away or, or later. So that's kind of neat. And that's again, just a, a short answer. And so I just add a question, multiple choice, true or false, short answer. So for example, if I'm adding a short answer, you just type it in here. And here's some possible correct answers. If I wanna add an image, like super user-friendly, it's pretty explanatory. Uh, self-explanatory what to do. And if not, then you're going to check out YouTube, right, for tutorials. What's also cool is you can, for free, customize the name of your room. So for this uh, session, I called it Slick. I can't do that right now because there's people in the room, but. And so if I go back to my results, I can see here, um, sort of in a grid fashion, I can also download these in a, in, into a spreadsheet. I've done a writing activity with kids before where like each, like I downloaded the, basically the class list as questions. And so each question was a student's name. And then when students uh, would answer the Socrative, they would compliment each student. So they would, you know, would say, Jean Ar Arscott, and you say, oh, you're really nice. And then the next question would be Sarah. And she would say, oh, you're super smart. Or we were practicing compliments and it was kind of a neat, a neat activity. And then you can actually, you know, download that spreadsheet and print it off for students and, and give them little bookmarks with all their little compliments. So it's sort of a neat, a really neat app that is, um, if you've used Kahoot before, uh, very, very similar. The difference is that you can do short, short answer. Um, and then also there's a game uh, where it's a space race. So the, you know, the kids pick like a little rocket or a spaceship or whatever, and they have to, you know, answer all the questions right to race to the end. And so they find that a lot of fun. Okay. I'm going to move on to extensions. So we talked about how extensions are things that make Google Chrome sort of more fun. <laughs> Just give it a little bit more functionality. And so here are a bunch of different ones for you. And I'm just going to show you quickly how that sort of works. So for example, uh, Tab Scissors and Tab Blue. Uh, have you ever like wanted to look at one website on one of your screens and then have, you know, I've got all of these windows open, but I kind of want like these three to be split away. So what I'm going to do is tab scissor them, and then it's going to split my screens into two. Um, and then when I want them to come back, I'm just going to use tab glue to make sure that they go back together. Just, you know, well, because of the. There you go. And then it's just going to glue them all back together. So just an easy way of kind of like splitting your screens up if you're if you're ever uh, doing work on one screen and, and need to copy to another, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ad block, i am uh, got the link up there for you. I'm just gonna fix that link because it's not link, but um, that's the one that's gonna get rid of YouTube commercials. So you're not gonna have the ads on YouTube, um, but it also has, um, Okay, I'll have to type, I'll put in the link to that one later. For some reason, it didn't link in there, so I'll just have to do it later. Um, but yeah, that's a great one for getting rid of um, pop-ups on, on different websites, but also the, especially the YouTube ads, because I find, especially when you're teaching a foreign language, sometimes the, the um, ads are quite inappropriate. Turn off the lights is a neat one too. What it does is, so you've got the YouTube video and everything else around it just goes to black. So it's a little bit less distracting. So it's kind of a neat one. 
Um, if you work on a lot of documents and you copy and paste a lot, you're going to love clipboard history. So, for example, um, have you ever copied something into a document and then you'll go copy something else and like maybe the next day you needed that website again. So you have to go Google it and open it and get the link and copy it again. Or you just insert clipboard history, um, add that extension and it keeps a copy or keeps track of all of your things that you've copied to the clipboard in the past. And so uh, kind of a neat way to, to save some time there. Another great one for language teachers to save some time is Accent Grid. And so with Accent Grid, what this does is it adds this little accent here and you can customize these. So I've put in all my French accents that I like. And if you right click and click on options, now, in the past, you had to have the HTML code, so that's what I have, but you don't need that anymore. You can just type the accent or the weird character that you want, just type it in there or copy and paste it in. So you do that once, and then I have all of my accents here, and if I want this A, for example, then I'm just going to go like that and paste it. And so I can paste it into a document. I copies it to the clipboard, so even if I'm using like a Word document, it'll work, uh, which is really neat. And you see here, option save successfully. So you see, I don't have to have the HTML code. I can just type in the accent and that works fine. And so that's a, a good one for language teachers. If you're using Google Classroom and you've ever wanted to, uh, especially if you're, uh, can use in the classroom, I would have this up on uh, the smart board, but you can also for online classes, if you're asking a question, you wanna randomly select a kid, you get this random student generator from Google Classroom. And then when you click on the extension, you, it just has a list of your classes from Google Classroom. You click on that and then it will give you a, a random student name to, to answer your question. So that's kind of a, a neat one there. Uh, next one for reading and writing, I've got these together. So read and write for Google Chrome is uh, an uh, extension that will, it's also an app that will help with uh, doing, so speech to text, text to speech. It also has where it, uh, text prediction, you can highlight text, uh, get visual dictionaries and glossaries and, and things like that. And so it's a great, uh, you know, inclusive tool when you're, you've got different levels in your classroom you've got some students that may need some support with reading and writing and they've got a whole bunch of different languages um even chinese is getting better and better on read and write for google so please uh check that out if you have some students that may need some some support with with reading and writing small pdf so edit compress and convert pdfs basically if you're looking to take pdfs and easily put them into your uh, google docs or google slideshows that's a great extension for that and I've got two, or I guess three here for kind of online video and things. So Screencastify is an extension that will record a video from your webcam or a video of your screen. So like if I was doing this presentation not on Zoom, um, I could use Screencastify to record the screen. Google Meet breakout rooms is just makes big breakout rooms. So you can say uh, my class of 30 kids in my Google Meet in my video conference, I'd like to have six different rooms and it'll put the kids in there. You can then kind of randomize where they go or you can make specific kids in each group. It's really neat. And then finally, the, the grid view there is just a grid view for Google Meet. Uh, these ones are just some fun. So now that you've like added all of these extensions, you're gonna get Extensity. So what that does is instead of having one uh, or instead of having a bunch of little extension um, icons that you would kind of have to sift through and it takes up a lot of space on your Chrome browser, you just have Extensity and it makes them into one nice list. If you ever want to insert bitmojis or emojis into your writing, your emails or whatever, even GIFs, there's some little extensions there that you can use. Web Paint will let you highlight, paint, draw on any website. So that can be really helpful when you're trying to point things out to students. And then especially for online learning, this custom cursor for Chrome and for Chrome will make your cursor, you know, sort of just big and hard to miss. So if you're, you know, having students look at things online um, through an online class or even, you know, to be able to see the cursor from the back of the room if you're in person on the smart board, having a nice big kind of multicolored cursor can, can really help with that. Now. 
One that used to be an add-on, but is now an extension is Draftback. And this is pretty cool. So what it does is you've got a document, you go, you install Draftback. If you click the uh, Draftback extension, it comes up on the Google Doc. There's a little, you'll see here in this GIF in this video that there's Draftback. So you click that. So this is the guy he's typing. He's making his, his document. Um, so your students are working. Then you click on Draftback. It creates a video of that. So you can really see students' writing process, um, which is great for conversational evidence of learning. So when you're looking at that sort of um, talking about our learning and um, how we learn, then this is a great tool for students. But it's also great for the teacher if you're ever not sure if maybe they had used, um, you know, like a translation tool or something. We well, see that right away because they would have a large portion of text that just gets pasted in. So all of a sudden they've got this paragraph that like, just shows up and so that's a a great uh a great neat little tool now very quickly i'm going to show you a few add-ons so doc to form especially um if you're new to technology this might be a neat one for you because if you still have a lot of tests that are in word documents you can upload those word documents into google drive convert them to a word doc and then use this add-on to turn them into a google form so then you can have automatic marking no more you know scantron uh paper cuts and things like that so that's kind of neat and also, if you're a huge fan of Microsoft Word and you've tried using Google Docs, but maybe there's one or two features that just isn't in Google Docs yet, if you um, do the Doc Tools add-on in Google Docs, it has a lot of those. So, for example, being able to sort a column in a chart um, in a Word or in a Google Doc, you can do it in the Google Spreadsheet, but not in the Doc. And so, with Doc Tools, it'll do that. Uh, easy bibliography, so just helps you really uh, insert super easy bibliographies and awesome, awesome add on. Easy accents, it brings up just a little window on the side with the accents that you might need. And so you just have to click on them and really easy for students to add into add into documents. And if you ever have, for example, um, an assignment that you're giving kids on a Word doc, and maybe they have to go watch a video for some instructions or some cultural content. If you have the DocuTube add-on, then you can play YouTube videos right inside the Google Docs. So then the kids aren't leaving that assignment and uh, just makes it, you know, even more, uh, more accessible right in there. Uh, next, I'm going to mention is this MindMeister, which takes a bulleted list and turns it into a mind map. So super simple, um, but really, really functional. Two of kind of my favorite ones that I've left for last year is Kaizena. So this is for docs and slides, and it allows you to have uh, audio feedback. So you can leave audio comments for kids on their, um, on their work. And then Orange Slice is uh, a way for you to, if you have an assignment for kids um, on the uh, assignment that you're giving out, for example, in Google Classroom, you can put the rubric in the bottom of the document and then use Orange Slice to uh, kind of click, you know, what they got in each of those, in each of the sections on your rubric. It'll add it all up. It uh, puts the total in the title of the document. So it's super easy for you later to, you know, transcribe that into your, into your grading system, whatever that might be, uh, sends an email to the kid. Um, and so, yeah, just a really neat uh, rubric. And there's also a student version um, if you want students to give peer feedback. So you can also check that out. And I see that our time is up, so I'm not going to talk about Pear Deck a whole lot, except to say that it's super cool. Um, this is an example. So besides the sorry, besides the multiple choice and short answer, they also have these dragging and draw um, questions. So, for example, you can give thumbs up and thumbs down and you can see where all of the students have, have put their cursor. And so that's kind of a neat thing. There's a little demo video there that you can check out. So it's an app, but it's also a slides on add on. So I could add this um, to my slides from today and I could just go to my slide here and ask you to draw a circle around or drag your cursor to whichever add on you're going to try tomorrow, for example. And so a super, super cool um, 
uh, app and add-on. So I actually suggest trying the add-on first, especially if you've got a lot of really nice Google slideshows that you're using in your classrooms, because it's just making them a little more interactive. The multiple choice and text number are part of the free version. Um, and the draggable drawing is part of the paid version. But check with your district because there's a lot of school districts out there, like I, I believe Edmonton Public Schools, we have a license for our teachers. So if you sign on with uh, your school email address, then you get the free, you get the full version. So just uh, check that out. We're a couple minutes over, but not too bad. Um, if there's any questions that you'd like to, to share. You can throw those in the chat while you're uh, thinking if you've got some questions and, and that I'll uh, just share with you that I got my slides from Slides Carnival again tonight. So if you weren't with us in the first session, this is a, and there's links is right there, a website that has free slide decks for Google Slides or PowerPoint. And they come with all of these neat little um, my colleagues call them the wingdings, but they're, you know, neat little icons and stuff. And they've got some uh, graphics like you for you to make infographics. And that's what's great. Not seeing. Here we go. I got the sense that all of these tools would be easily accessible to students who have Chrome or Google Suite. Google Suite. Were there any that students would have to create their own account, log out, or download an app? So with most any of the apps, if you're ever looking to get feedback from the students in that, or for you to be able to see their work, um, or for them to be able to come back to it, then they're going to have to have um, some kind of an account. Now, with regards to the um, Google Slides, or with a Google accounts, that is free. So if your district is not a Google Apps district, or if you don't have the Google Workspace for education, then um, that's actually free. So you can go to their website and, and get your school uh, or have your school or your school district uh, do that for free. Um, and if not, creating a Gmail is free. So you can use any of those tools with Gmail or with a, a straight Google account. With regards to the extensions, you can add them. You don't need an account, but if you ever uh, sort of got logged out of Chrome, then you would have to um, put them in, like you would have to install them again. So that's why we log into Chrome um, so that, you know, it saves all of that. And then for Socrative, there's no sign in. So like you did tonight, you go and you just put in the room number. And so there's no, um, you know, sign in or anything like that, that that you need to do. And I think that's about, I hope that answers your question with that. Thanks. And then for the upvote on the Jamboard, I would, uh, I have students put a star. So like if uh, somebody has a sticky note that you thought was super, like I agree with that, upvote it, then just add a star. And so sometimes you'll have four or five stars. Um, we actually had, I got that from when we were doing like the awards night for the school and uh, the teachers would all go, you know, kind of look at different things and, you know, put stars and that really helped, I thought. I'm just gonna scroll up and see if there's any more questions. So the slideshow, I put the link in there. And I'm sorry, I just put it in again. I haven't tried Moat, but I'm actually, I've heard about it, so I'm gonna do that. 